Hey everyone, uh, I'm Seva. On the call with me is also my colleague Roman, and we'll talk about a tool that we're building at the moment, which is called Metrink. Uh, it's an open source personalization service, and uh, we'll try to showcase why uh, we're building it and how you can actually use it uh, in the wildlife. Uh, we've been in the personalization space for about six years together. Uh, me mostly from the product side, Roman uh, from the Roman being a big brain behind the scenes, uh, like doing all the crazy measuring stuff. Uh, and he's been in the ML space for more than 10 years. Uh, what is personalization? Uh, for us, personalization is showing uh, the same items, but in different order to different users. So taking their personal actions to, to order items differently. Uh, there are usually when talking about personalization, there are two modes. Uh, mostly people talk about the offline mode. Uh, with offline modes, typically you have some sort of a batch job that uh, computes uh, ranking for each customer, uh, for each user of your website, of your shop, et cetera, uh, once a day or like several times a day, depending on how you, uh, how you do it. Uh, with online ranking, however, uh, all the calculation happens almost in real time. So depending on what the user does directly uh, on the website within his session, uh, the ranking will change almost immediately. Uh, I don't like the word real time, but it all, it's almost real time. Um, both of these approaches have their pros and cons. Uh, with offline mode, it's usually useful when you have a lot of returning visitors. Uh, think about Amazon, uh, a lot of like the database there is huge and a lot of people return to Amazon each and every day uh, to do their shopping so they can run uh, their, their ML jobs once a day and uh, personalize the ranking. However, um, what we've seen in our experience is that in typical small to medium sized e-commerce websites, uh, up to 80% of the visitors are coming only once and they're not returning back. So you have really a really small window of opportunity uh, to hook them and uh, to sell them your, your goods. Um, so the offline mode will not work in this case and you should be doing only the online mode. Personalization itself is not uh, implemented only on e-commerce sites like Amazon or Zalando. It can be seen on content websites to personalize your favorite kitties. Uh, it can also be seen in the social networks, in the ads space. Uh, everyone knows Google, Facebook, uh, they're doing personalization in their feeds. And uh, why everyone is doing that? Because it actually works. Um, you see that uh, like this, these are actual A-B test results uh, that we've conducted uh, in, uh, at multiple stores from different industries. Of course, the, uh, the benefit is kind of differs from industry to industry, but even a 6% increase of, in conversion rate compared to the baseline is a huge improvement, uh, especially if you have uh, a lot of revenue. So, uh, all, like different companies, uh, they have uh, they different goals, they have different contexts, uh, they personalize things differently, but they have the same problem. Uh, building personalization is really hard, uh, especially making so that it works as expected. Uh, we have this small pyramid uh, of things that you need to go through in order to achieve personalization that really works and brings relevant results because you can build a thing, it will work, but uh, it will not improve your conversion or click-through rates or whatever. Uh, we have Airbnb as an example. Uh, they've posted some time ago this article on how they've been doing uh, real-time online personalization for their experiences offering. And uh, they have like eight, um, they had eight uh, ML engineers with a lot of experience and it took them about four iterations. And I think, uh, about like six to eight months to actually get to, to the online personalization. So this, um, our uh, talks to, uh, to people from small and big companies like Shopify Yelp also prove that as well, because people say that uh, it takes about six months to get to the first A-B tests uh, that are working. And even more than that, 
like to get positive results uh, of the of those A/B tests. So uh, let's say that you want to build the personalization uh, into your website, into your store, into your social network. You have several options. Uh, you can choose the L, um, the Airbnb row. So you build everything from scratch. You take your product store. Uh, you put uh, the data pipelines, build the ML models, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, most likely you will succeed. However, you will need a lot of time and you will need a really experienced team to get there. So time and money uh, will be the constraints here. Alternatively, you can choose some SaaS that already does all the personalization and typically integrating a SaaS into a working project is not a nightmare. So it won't take six months, but let's say it will take a few weeks to do that. However, uh, with SaaS, there are other constraints like data privacy. Uh, all the data that has been collected on your website will be sent to this SaaS to do personalization. So you will not own that data uh, and GDPR and CCPA uh, compliances will come in place. Also, uh, usually SaaS companies have limited uh, configuration options. So if you have some specific requirements, most likely the SaaS will not be able to fulfill those. And uh, if you would want those fulfilled, you will have to pay a lot of money to do that. But uh, uh, what if there is an alternative to all, of, to all these two approaches? Uh, what if there is already a tool that can automate the common parts uh, with building the machine learning model, extracting features, uh, training the models, serving them, et cetera. That's, why, that's where Metrank comes in. Uh, Metrank uh, tries to automate the most common parts uh, of, those, of the, those personalization steps. And uh, we try to implement only the ones that are essential to get it to personalization. So we have the feature store in place, but it's, it's a minimal feature store that uh, satisfies only, only the needs of personalization uh, in the case of Metrank. And uh, Roman will tell us how this works and uh, how you can use it. Yeah, so MetaRank is essentially as an it can be treated as an oracle. So you ask it how these items should be ranked in this particular context, and it will try to maximize some sort of a business metric like CTR. And uh, it based this bases its predictions not only on the real time data coming right now, but also on some traffic history. And it's actually based on some modern and uh, hyped approaches on the design of mesh learning systems. So there is some sort of a feature store inside. Uh, we gave another talk about feature store inside the, on, on another top. So you can Google it on Google it on YouTube. Uh, but the general idea of the meta rank is that we made uh, just some technical part, which trade the uh, technical thing called feature store, uh, which, uh, Oh, whatever. So MetaRank is just a wrapper on top of feature store, just a data schema, the feature config and some business uh, uh, business logic to update some different machine learning features. So uh, it's an open source tool. It's a single jar file. Uh, you can run it locally. You don't need a Kubernetes cluster just to play with it. And uh, the MetaRank itself has two important parts, not parts, but more like modes of running. So it can run in offline mode to ingest your historical data and online mode to do the actual inference. So to play with the meta rank, you need some sort of historical data about your customer behavior. You need to ingest it and process it. You need to train a model and switch to online mode to start serving all the data you already processed. Uh, so MetaRank itself is a secondary ranking system. So it won't do search for you. It won't compute recommendations. Uh, so you need to some second, first layer of ranking uh, being available. So in case of search, it should be elastic search. In case of recommendations, it can be some static pre-computed recommendations made with Spark ILS, with LightFM or whatever you want. There can be even just Postgres in case if you need to personalize some like a layout of a blog with different news. So, but still it just this, it's generic enough and agnostic enough to different types of content. It just operates on the level of identifiers. And 
we wanted to have some sort of a sample problem for MetaRank so we can solve it together during the slides. So it's not like a live coding because it's just too scary for me. Uh, but we want to do some sort of a generalized ranking problem uh, solution with MetaRank. So imagine that you have a search uh, and you're searching for socks. So in a perfect world, you just have Elasticsearch with the different documents there with different fields. You search for socks and you get a BM25 score at the, at the end. So it's quite easy to understand how it should be ranked. But the generalized ranking problem is more about how can you mix the text relevancy with some extra business level parameters you can get from outside. So what if we know that, uh, what if we want to use different weights for matches over title or over description field? In Elasticsearch, it's usually done, or in Solar, with, with Boost, so you can say, okay, the title field is more important than description field 10 times. But the question is, why 10 times? Why it's not 20 or maybe 5? So you can play around and find out some sort of a local Optima solution, but finding a global optimal solution from the mathematical perspective or statistical perspective is a bit more complicated thing. But we might want to also add some sort of a feedback into our ranking. So, okay, we have different boost. We also have clicks. So we know that this seven, this product with the blue socks has not that good text relevancy, but it gets much more clicks. So maybe it should be also promoted a bit higher. We don't know. Uh, there are some approaches, common approaches for Elasticsearch, like rank feature query or script score query. But the general idea is that you still need to somehow uh, define weights for mixing all these three numbers into a single ranking number. But uh, adding more features, you can also notice that amount of clicks differs for different uh, items. So some products are more popular on desktop, some pop products are more popular on mobile. So you might also compute separate weights per segment. And what if there are a lot of segments? So it quickly becomes quite a complicated thing to run and maintain. So you're covering more corner cases, but you introduce some other corner cases. And uh, there is still unclear how you should tune your weights for this mixing of different parameters into a single ranking formula. And it's not that hard to do with MetaRank. So we'll try to solve this problem and mix different uh, signals uh, for, for in the optimal ranking formula without just writing any code, hopefully. Uh, so we need to do, like I've said, four steps. So we need to be able to ingest new documents uh, from your inventory. We need to prepare our historical click-throughs, like the activity people did with your uh, site in the past. We need to configure the meta rank and teach it how to map from this uh, historical events and real-time events into machine learning features and uh, go online and do some inference. Uh, so the first step, uh, uh, when we talk about search, it's usually designed in some sort of a, this way. So you have an inventory, like a database of your products, blog posts, or whatever. And when uh, there's something changed inside of your inventory, you just index it uh, through the Elasticsearch. With MetaRank, it's just the same thing. So you should also kind of index it, but there is no index inside MetaRank. You should just need to notify that the document was updated. So if your product was added or modified, you not only index it through Elasticsearch, you just send some message to the MetaRank that, OK, this field, this product was updated. And the ingestion process is there are two ways. Actually, there is just a single way right now, only the REST API. We plan to implement a Kafka connector in the next version. But the general idea is the same. You just drop some messages about document updates there and call it a day. And the example of this document metadata message is like this. So there are a couple of required fields like the identifier of uh, item and the timestamp and some uh, information about fields. For example, it's a title, price, color, and availability. And we're going to try to use these fields later in the ranking. Uh, 
And you don't also need to send the whole product update at once. It can be like partial or incremental. If your price changes, you don't need to send title. And uh, uh, let's then prepare our historical data for, for the training. So we are focused on this particular part of, uh, of our architecture. So we need to have two extra things about customer behavior in the past, like rankings, what was run there displayed to customer and how customer interacted with this ranking. So clicked purchase at that to cart, not really important, but it's still some sort of a feedback over a ranking. And example of this ranking event also, it looks like a metadata event but with some extra small differences. So there is a user and session information. You can put a query, but it's still like a fuzzy thing. You can put any field you want. And uh, there are items with their relevancy. The relevancy is that the signal you got from the first level of ranking. So it can be DM25 score coming from Elasticsearch, or it can be some cosine and similarity from recommendations, or it can be omitted at all if there is nothing known about relevancy. And the interaction looks also like this almost the same, but with some minor changes, like there are, can be different types of interactions, like clicks, cutting uh, cards, purchases, but you are not limited to any strict schema. These are just strings. And there should be a reference to the parent event. So we can join them into a single click through. Like you know, these items were displayed and then someone clicked on a, this particular item. So this metadata updates, the rankings and interactions should be like in a file in a JSONL format. It can be you know, HDFS, a three local file system compressed, uncompressed, it's not really important. So you just need to be, be prepared for the future processing. And the next step is just to explain how these events can be mapped into a machine learning model. So the idea of MetaRank is just to have uh, like a Lego blocks. You have a different uh, feature extractors which can map, typic, solve some typical and small problems some, uh, of converting these events, and, like parse user agent, parse uh, referer field, or do some customer profiling, compute counters or rates or whatever. So you can just combine them together, do a bit of a YAML code writing, and call it a day. So let's just write some sample configuration for that. So our metadata event from the previous slides got a price. So why don't we just take a price from this metadata event as is and put it uh, into a feature called price. So the type is actually the type of feature extractor. It's called a number and it scopes it into the item. So it's an item feature. Uh, okay, we can do some more complicated things like take a color field, which is actually a string and we cannot use string as is in a machine learning model, we need to convert it to some sort of a number. As a color is a low cardinality thing, we can do just a one hold encoding of it to a vector of three. So it's red, green, and blue. Uh, we can go further and take this relevancy uh, parameter out of the ranking for each product and also use it as a part of our ranking formula. Uh, we can also take some fields from there, like user agent or, for example, refer field, and also parse it and one hold and code it as a mobile desktop or tablet. So it will be just three different features, like a flags, depending on what was in the original user agent. We can do counters. So, for example, with the interaction count feature extractor, you can count all the clicks happened on a specific item. But this type of counter is global one, so it's not really a good idea to do because it will be always increasing. So we need some sort of a time bound. And there is a window count type of feature extractor, which does exactly this particular job but it's configured in a more complicated way. So you not only need the name of this feature extractor, but the bucket size and how just windows of uh, number of buckets. So it's essentially seven days, 14 days, 30 and 60 days rolling window counts for a particular item. I forgot to put scope item here, sorry. But anyway, there is a 
correct version in the docs. And uh, we can also do some sort of a, a per field matching. So our ranking event has a query parameter. So like what if it's a ranking and it is a search results, we have a search query. So we can intersect this ranking field, the query field, with all the titles of all the items in the ranking and using the engram method. Unfortunately, there is only engram methods right now supported. We plan to do some Lucene stemming to make it more robust. And you can do the same thing with the description field. So at the end, if you unfold all these feature extractors into a single table for our uh, ranking events and clicks happening on this ranking events, you will get something like this. So there are multiple items and there are different features like, okay, description field matching the title, the price, different colors, different platforms and different time windows for a number of clicks happened on this product. So you just have a different giant table of features. But on a historical uh, data processing part, you also know that for this particular ranking, the visitor uh, clicked on the product number three. So it means that, so according to the cascading click model, we assume that item one and item two were examined, but not clicked. So they are actually negative uh, implicit feedback and uh, item number, number three is a positive implicit feedback. We don't have no idea uh, what should we do with the item number four because it was probably never examined. So we're not taking into account. And this table as this can be just folded into a Lambda Mart model like XGBoost or like GBM. So we support actually both, but uh, more focused on Lambda Mart or well, like GBM right now. Uh, so uh, we did all the configuration part and let's just discuss how it should be integrated at the end. So it's still the same way as for the as any other secondary ranking, ranking uh, system. So you, for each search query, you send your query at first to Elasticsearch, and then uh, they take top end candidates from there, send it to MetaRank for a ranking, and uh, call it a day. But you also need to send a stream of metadata rankings and interactions. So, um, there is also an article about more detailed article about how MetaRank can be used with all the hairy details about running it with the just different command line parameters and so on and so forth for both training and bootstrapping and so on and, and uh, but uh, unfortunately for recommendations, but the approach is still the same. The features are a bit different and the the resulting baseline uh, ranking is different, but the approach is still the same. Uh, so the current status of MetaRank is kind of an alpha. We have a demo, uh, so I'm going to try to use it. It sometimes crashes, but still it's always fun. So demo is about personalizing movies. So we have a, now, oh, so I uh, will refresh the page, sorry. So my session will be reset. So what's going on in this demo? So there are different tags. Uh, and you, if you click on something like a fantasy, you will get top uh, movies for this tag, top by sorted by popularity. And uh, uh, you can, there is also a special button here showing you all the features which are actually used for the ranking for this particular uh, movie. And all the personalized features are zero, but still. And let's click on Star Wars and see what will happen. And booms, there are more Star Wars here, like expected. But still, we can see that our features were dependent on my behavior, were updated. So for this particular movie, we know that I liked Star Wars and my profile was intersected with this particular movie. So there are three genders, uh, genders uh, intersected, actors are the same, tags, director is the same. So probably I might also like this, uh, this movie. It's based on some uh, real data set uh, we built with the Tolok AI platform with the real customers, with the real people. So it's not just some synthetic data set, it's an open source. You can go and check on our GitHub. Uh, but we still have quite a large backlog of things we need to do. 
So for example, the distributed node, we the backlog is large enough, but still the we build this tool to solve our own problem because it was painful for us to build yet another learn to rank system. But we found that it can be also useful for other people. So if you feel that it seems sounds interesting for you, so you can ping us, describe your use case. If you have any problems, and probably you will <laughs> report them on GitHub. So you can star us on GitHub. Uh, it's an old screenshot. We have much more stars right now, so it's not that bad. Uh, so we have a Slack if you want to talk to us and LinkedIn follow us there. So uh, that's it. Thank you for listening.